Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. What are they going to say when the central banking system dies? They're going to say it was a kind system, that they were wise men, they had plans, man, they had wisdom. Blushima, man. They're going to say the Kaiser Report was right. That was my best Dennis Hopper. Bulshima? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, Swahili. <laughs> for <laughs> Well, okay. First, I want to say, by the way, a little bit off track on terms of the central bankers, but I want to talk about a man who is not necessarily a wise man. In fact, some say he's a not-so-wise man, and these are the billboards right here. This went up outside of Chicago just last night. Crowdfunded by StartJoin.com. Oh, yeah, check it out. This, this is new media in action. Crowdfunding on StartJoin plus cryptocurrency, StartCoin. New media bursting through. Here's the Sean Hannity billboard. And, you know, the Sean Hannity, of course, was notoriously supportive of the Gaza massacre, and people were unhappy about it, but they weren't gave, their voice was not heard in mainstream media. So crowdfunding plus crypto equals breakthrough mainstream media. And why do we have these crowdfunding platforms and cryptocurrencies? And it's because of the failure of the central banking system. So we're going to look at some of these when the central banking system dies, what are go people going to say about it? And here's a headline. More QE. These charts show the pauperization of workers in the UK and America since 2008. And then in a big subheadline, designated losers of monetary policy. Done in the now classic way, key ingredient, the Bank of England printed enormous amounts of money, repressed interest rates, and stirred up inflation, which hit 5% in 2011. But somebody had to pay for it, savers and workers. It demolished real wages and purchasing power of the people who make up the rest of the economy. So we're going to look at a chart. And the chart shows you this pauperization of the British worker in response to quantitative easing and paper printing by the central banks here in order to bail out the bankers. And here's the chart. You can see that the real wage inflation rises have been consistently below inflation, even as the, is reported by the UK government. Yeah, I, I see in Britain the, uh, the, the, the pensioners are concerned you know, that their pensions are not giving them the kind of money that they thought that they were getting, and their returns are near 0%. But remember, the banks failed, so where did the central banks get the money to bail out the banks. They got it from pensioners. They stole it from pensioners using interest rate policy to artificially move interest rates down to zero. They didn't say that that was the case. They said they were trying to stimulate the economy. But now, here we are five or six years later, the economy hasn't been stimulated. In fact, it continues to contract. Uh, the employment numbers that they targeted as being a certain level that would re then reverse policies and start to raise rates back to their normalized level. Uh, they haven't done that. Mark Carney is caught lying now two or three times. All the central bankers saying, oh, we're not yet ready to raise rates because they're not yet ready to steal money. Uh, stop stealing money from pensioners, from savers, and giving it to those uh, who are in the banking charade, the banking kleptocracy. And this is continuing, as we've been saying. But, you know, new media and new finance, new platforms, crowdfunding plus crypto is the new reality that has to grow out of the abyss that is central banking a nightmare that's giving us all these problems today all go back to central banking the jihadis it all goes back to central banking all the wars central banking who are the terrorists it's not freaking guys in masks chopping off heads that's the symptom the disease is bernanke and mark carney and janet yellen that's the problem well to people like the kaiser report and our audience we look at janet yellen and mark carney and Mario Draghi, and we see the Marlon Brando character in Apocalypse Now, this grotesque creature in the forest with all of these lackeys around him, and uh, crazy and deranged like, you know, the Dennis Hopper character is like Joe Wiesenthal or Paul Krugman saying, Would he, nobody else understands these central blankers like I understand them. He, they're genius. Just because it looks like disaster and apocalyptic around you, it doesn't mean that you just don't understand it. Yeah, and exactly like Apocalypse Now, you know, uh, Barack Obama or David Cameron will point to a body of children with their limbs cut off and say, that's the genius of Janet Yellen. That's the genius of Mark Carney. Look at the carnage they've created. Look at these jihadis around the world chopping people people's head off. Don't you get it? Mark Corning's a genius. 
And they are just like Apocalypse Now, the lackeys surrounding the Marlon Brand character. Up the river, the heart of darkness. And, uh, but the new media, cryptocurrencies and crowdfunding, is here to obliterate those guys. And so here is the next headline regarding the United Kingdom. Under 30s being priced out of the UK, says social mobility czar. Since the financial crisis, the Bank of England has jumped through hoops to bail out the city. And this is regarding Alan Milburn, a former uh, cabinet minister in the Labour government. And now he's on this... Uh, it's, it's ironic, actually, to have a mobility, social mobility czar, you know, the, the opposite of social mobility would be a neo-feudal, feudal sort of system. Well, Britain is on the verge of becoming permanently divided between tribes of haves and have-nots as the young increasingly miss out on the opportunity enjoyed by their parents' generation, the government's social mobility czar says. And he says in particular that they're priced out of the housing market. So this is what the only option for social mobility is having a house here and being able to, you know, policy set around it, first of all, limiting supply and then forcing huge amounts of capital and corrupt cash money laundered cash from around the world into the same properties. Yeah, I mean, my message to the young people in Britain is that they don't have to join Jihad. They don't have to do that. Uh, that's the only alternative that David Cameron is giving them. The blowback is that people are getting destroyed here in the country because of these policies that favor the upper ton, tenth of a percent. Okay, they can do other things. They can go down the path of cryptocurrencies, crowdfunding, P2P, uh, uh, social networking. Um, you have 3D printing, these new technologies that are emerging to obliterate these, these, the status quo. They don't have to join Jihad. I know David Cameron loves Jihad. All the Jihadis now speak with a British clipped British accent because that's where they come from, but well, they don't have to go down that path. But at least even Jihad suggests a journey. This is not a journey, it's a cycle. It's a Ponzi scheme, which is a repetitive cycle. So the only way to win the, what you're calling jihad, which I call Ponzi scheme, the only way to win in a Ponzi scheme is to be allowed, invited in first into the pyramid scheme, the Ponzi scheme, whatever you want to call it. The only way is to be invited in first. So the, the policy by the central banks has been to reward those who were in first. Everybody has piled all their capital into it in order to try to gain, get the same sort of gains that those first few lucky winners won. And yet, so the, the economy around us is collapsing because real jobs need to be done. Look at what around Colonel Kurtz in the jungle. Nothing is done except for slaughter and, and apocalyptic scenes. And that's what our economy, that's what our financial markets, that's what our equity markets, that's what our bond markets look like. By collapsing, the middle is collapsing. So you have this, this barbell approach to the economy of the extreme rich and the extreme poor. So the middle is definitely collapsing. And to get over the middle is now becoming virtually impossible. And the point of having a social contract between the, those who are the elected uh, representatives and those who do the electing is that they work together to have a muni uh, beneficial mutual uh, end. But here in the UK and in the US, that social contract has been severed. That's why when you have a debate between Johnny Rotten or John Lydon versus Russell Brand on whether to vote or not to vote, and Russell Brand says don't vote, Johnny Lydon says, well, you might as well vote. I side with Russell Brand because the social contract is broken, Johnny Rotten. Therefore, as John Locke said many years ago, the people must revolt. The social contract has been broken for those under 30. That's why the likes of Johnny Rotten probably bought some of Margaret Thatcher's help to buy projects. He's probably raking it. He was first in on the Ponzi scheme that I talked about. Those under 30 or near 30 have never were able to get in on that Ponzi scheme of free cash. So that's why that that's the contract that's been broken is between the previous generation and this generation, the millennial generation, as they call it. Yeah, well, he is. He's reaping the benefit of being at the right time on the Ponzi scheme, and he's now trying to draw, pull up the drawbridge, and anyone who wants to span that chasm, you know, they're being vilified as being uh, jihadis. You know, everyone's a jihadi who's not on the property ladder. That's the way the government sees it here. And then, so finally, regarding the sort of, well, Colonel Kurtz, Hank Paulson is uh, somebody who kind of looks like Colonel Kurtz, a taller, thinner Colonel well, Kurtz. Well, remember I tried to call Fatwa against Hank Paulson back in 2008, but no moolah took me up on it. They're all, you know, asleep at the switch. Well, they threw quite a lot of moolah at him. And this is the AIG bailout trial bombshell number three. Paulson lied to Congress about TARP. So, you know, Hank uh, Greenberg is suing. He's, he was at, formerly at 
AIG. He's a huge shareholder still to this day in AIG, and he feels like he was uh, betrayed and, and, and defrauded by the government, so he's suing them. But a lot of interesting information is coming out in Discovery. So remember in the last crash, I think we're in the beginning of a new one. That's my opinion. I might be wrong, but I think we are. And so the last crash in 2008, Hank Paulson went all sweaty to Congress and said, here, sign this three-page paper about uh, TARP. And it's only to buy assets, these troubled assets, which the market is incorrectly pricing. The market is sacred, but this time it's wrong. So we'll let, we're going we're gonna to buy these toxic assets. This is what he said to Congress. But the, um, the testimony by Scott Alvarez, who was the general counsel for the Federal Reserve Bank Board of Governors, that, that he was asked about the September 15th conference call in which Tim Geithner and various Treasury secretaries and governors of the board of, of the Federal Reserve Bank were on this call. And he was asked about what, what they were uh, discussing at this point, and they had mentioned that they needed legislative changes for systemic reasons. And the question goes, systemic reason? What does that mean, asked the lawyer. His answer, Scott Alvarez's answer was, that if there was a systemic need, there was some threat to the financial system, then the Fed and the Treasury could take certain emergency actions. This would be one of the potential legislative fixes we would seek. Question, and if Treasury and the Federal Reserve determined that there were systemic reasons to do so, then the two legislative fixes you identify here are one, buy any stock preferred or common and any debt, and the second is resolution authority by conservative or re receivership, is that right? And he said, that's right. So there he is, admitting under oath that the, the original intention from September 15th, their original conference call, was that it was always to uh, inject equity into these banks, never to buy these troubled assets. In fact, they never did buy any of the toxic debts. Well, it's coming out again, but it came out at the time. Okay, Th this is not news that we didn't already know. They, it was a bait and switch as everyone on Wall Street and the financial press that was informed called it. You know, Hank Paulson shamelessly went in front of Congress to get three quarters of a trillion dollar to bail out his former employer, Goldman Sachs, with, and cheerlead it on by uh, jihadis, jihadists <laughs> like uh, Warren Buffett. And you know, therefore, I've been vindicated. You know, at the time, people said yeah. I shouldn't have called for a fatwa to be called against <laughs> Hank Paulson. Here we are, five, six years later, and that was completely justified. Because unless you're willing to get rid of the uh, cancer at the very top, then you're going to live with cancer. Hank Paulson is walking cancer. Now, uh, quickly on that, I want to say, first of all, that the reason why he didn't want to admit to Congress the truth is because then Congress might have, like, cut, like, ousted the CEOs and the board and cut uh, bonuses, but they didn't. In fact, AIG received huge bonuses the following year. And the, the fact that AIG collapsed, I just want to remind people that it started here in London because of the AIG financial group here in London, right. uh, Joseph Cassano's group, that they had... 440 billion in subprime debts that, well, this is the art billion. of darkness. <laughs> yeah. London, yeah. infinite rehypothecation. I'm Martin Sheen. I'm going upriver until I find George Osborne and terminate with maximum prejudice. All right, Stacey, well, got to go. I got to go find uh, Georgie Porgy. Thank you. The horror. The horror. Stay tuned for the second half. A whole lot more. <sighs> Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Mitch Firestein, author of Planet Ponzi. Mitch, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Hi. Now, first of all, Mitch, you know, we covered in the first half this billboard that we put up in Chicago. We crowdfunded it on uh, StartJoin using the cryptocurrency StartCoin. And it says that Sean Hannity is an intellectual terrorist. What do you think? You know, I think there's a problem with mainstream media, as I'm sure that you've heard me say before. And people need to think about what is is the message and the narrative that people want to have out there and it's important. I think Fox News has their own narrative and their own script that they put across. I mean Obama won't even go on Fox. He has one interview to every hundred that he has elsewhere. So if you look at it, I mean it's very biased. Like over the weekend, I don't know if you saw the protests in central London, there was over a hundred thousand people trying to get a fair wage, which is really significant and important. The people are saying, look, we're not going to take it anymore. We're going to go out and we're going to protest, peaceful protests, over 100,000 people. I watched BBC, the way that it was reported, they had nine minutes. There was a tragedy in Nepal. They had a guy on the telephone for nine minutes talking about his daughter is okay, we found her, and thank goodness that we found her. And then they put on for about a minute, they said, oh, and by the way, there's a protest in London about people having uh, unequal pay, and that was it. Well, the state, the, state run, the state run broadcaster BBC is uh, highly uh, biased 
you know, they support the kleptocracy and corporatism, otherwise known as fascism. But I want to talk to you about this connection between wages and uh, central banking and, and finance. In other words, he had 100,000 people out there. They're trying to get higher wages. They're talking about higher wages. And of course, the government is saying, no, 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 higher wages would uh, stall the so-called recovery. They're against wages. But um, without wages, there is no real savings. And without savings, there's no capital. And without capital, there's no capitalism. So how can they justify no wages unless they just are outright fascists and saying it's just money printing and bombing? Well, exactly. There are, there are two things, Max, that are important, and, and we've talked about this before. Capital expenditures and savings drive economies forward, and that's organic growth being generated. Now, wages have been going down for seven years. Property has been going up, as we've discussed before. 25% of jobs created in 2013 were in the property sector. The average property manager at all of these places that you see on a high street is making 71000 The average wage in the UK is around 24000 and odd. So when the property market collapses, which it will, I mean, it's just an overinflated bubble by uh, Osborne and Carney, then you're going to have a massive wave of unemployed people. Now, getting back to the wage inequality and that whole scenario, when you see a dispersion in wages, first of all, democracy has been vaporized. We don't have democracy anymore. You have a two-party system where both parties have been fundamentally dishonest with the voters and not kept their promise once they've got into office. So I think that the way forward, and you're starting to see it with the protests, is there's going to be a third party that comes from out of nowhere. They're going to be elected, and they'll get a chance to tell the truth. Because the probability of somebody, after they've not told you the truth, um, staying on that same path and and going through and delivering on a promise is probably close to zero. Right. That's now, the, the thing that keeps the status quo going, though, are these property prices. In other words, the, the middle class is, is going to uh, just, uh, as you say, uh, close your eyes and buy them at the high, I think is what you say. That's so, right. So house prices are at the high, and people are saying, well, I don't care what the government's doing. I don't care that David Cameron supports genocide in other countries. I'm just going to buy these house prices because I'm getting equity extraction. I'm going down to the pub. I'm getting you know, pissed every single night of the week on my property extraction. I'm British. I'm on the street vomiting and urinating on myself. That's what it is to, to be British. Those are British values. House price speculation and self-defecation. Now, uh, other than that, the, uh, but, going, <laughs> <laughs> but let's go back to the first half a little bit because you mentioned this uh, inequality and social unrest. We're kind of alluding to it. There's a debate going on between Russell Brand, who says, don't vote, stage a revolution, and John Lydon, a.k.a. Johnny Rotten, who has come out and said, Russell Brand is a <laughs> that you, you have, in fact, uh, you should vote, and, you know, we fought the right to vote. Uh, my, my point of view is that Russell Brand is right because the social contract has been broken. And as John Locke has said, when the social contract is broken, he must revolt. What do you think? Well, I think Russell Brand has a point. He's articulated it very well when he was on Newsnight. I watched that. And they probably would never have him back on Newsnight because they don't like having guests on that can articulate an argument properly. So if you put together facts, that's one thing that scares the mainstream media away. If you, if you have a factual argument, they really don't want to hear it. I think that it's really important. We're in an election cycle in America, and what the big topics are Ebola and ISIS. But, and especially in the UK, none of the parties want to talk about debt, Max. That's the elephant in the room. I was going to bring an elephant here. Not really. But you mean Boris was, Johnson? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's right next he's door in his little cage. Wave. Hi, Boris. <laughs> but here's the point. Look, people want to talk about deficit reduction. The debt in this country is going up between two and three billion pounds a month. That's what the debt is going up. So is that a catastrophe waiting to happen? You bet it is, because revenues are declining, wages are going down. So I want to see right, let me jump the two in parties. Let me, parties. let me jump in Wait, here. But let me jump in. Darn it, it's my show. Now there's a chart that came out. You love charts. I'm going to talk about a chart. Oh, man. OK. It's talked about the fact that over the past five or six years, the prices of stuff that people are paying are up. 15%, but the wages are declining uh, 5%. So on a net-net basis, the, um, you've got a 10% reduction in real wages. Right. Real wages, 10% decline. So there's two questions. Well, one main question. 
it, it, how can the prices are up 15 percent in five years? Isn't that inflation? And number so how can when 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 Mark Carney gets on television or he talks before the Monetary Policy Committee or in the House of Commons, he's quoted in the House of Commons and saying, "We're fighting deflation." There's no inflation. So what, 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 how can he get away with that? Clearly, there, he's, he, somebody's lying here. You're right, but here's the point. Who's going to come out besides on this program where we're going to say, look, there is inflation because wages have been declining and the average person can't survive. That's why you had these protests in the street. So how are they going to make up the shortfall is, I guess, the question. Be people are using their houses and their property as an ATM. So they've extracted money from, from their property Second, right, third, fourth can, mortgage. House prices in London are going up an average of 480 pounds a day. That's right. So you can you don't have to work a stitch, and you can extract 400 pounds a day. And essentially, go down to the pub. Go down to the pub, and yeah. you can get drunk and defecate. As every British person, that's the British value. Well, drunk and defecation. That's the, what it means to be British. I see the cameramen are all British. They're nodding. I don't know. They can't I'm wait British, to get out I'm there British and drink too, and so, defecate. Yeah. Okay, but they get 400 free pounds a day by this free money mm -hmm. that's driving prices higher while wages are stagnant and destroying an entire class of people. An entire generation is being destroyed. This is the worse than, than, than the genocide we saw in Europe in the 30s. It's the David Cameron financial genocide. That's correct. But so, so, Max, the important takeaway here is the Labor Party and the Tory Party have to raise taxes exponentially because that's the only way these bills can be paid. So I want to see both parties say there will be no tax increases in anything. No one can say that because once that election in 2015 is gone, all bets are off. Everything changes. We actually talking about the um, corrections. If you want, we've got a, we've got a chart that we can go to. That let's go to the chart that we, that explains what happened with Greece last week. And Greece demonstrates a loss of confidence in the financial markets. If you look at the chart that we have here, you can see that the yields of the tenure the tenure went from I don't know uh, five percent and change up to over nine percent in a month. That demonstrates so or shows a collapse in the bond prices. Because well, people get that confused. Right, they right, say, oh, it, yields are going up. Uh, they don't understand that means bond prices are collapsing. Right. It means that there were tons of sellers of those bonds. because, And it also means that people are losing confidence in uh, Mario Draghi's Ponzi scheme, uh, the ECB, of doing whatever it takes and just realizing that he's full of hot air. And basically, he's trying to do what's called debt monetization which the Germans will never go for. And that's why it's been a sticky wicket. And they haven't gone and started purchasing these toxic assets. And Greek bonds are, are one thing that okay. are a toxic Last time asset. you were here, we covered this. And you were saying that you're making a call. Fourth quarter of this year, markets crash. Right. Last week, markets were really looking top heavy, as they say. They were, uh, NASDAQ had a 10% down move. The Russell 2000, the S&P, the Dow Jones all had sharp declines. It looked like, wow, Mitch is calling this to perfection. So, but my feeling is, and I think we're still, the, the jury's still out on this. You talk about Mario Draghi, you talk about the European Central Bank, you say that they will never buy toxic debt, but in my view, they will. They will no. come in, they'll buy $10 trillion worth of, or euros worth of toxic debt, and the Ponzi scheme will be extended for another year. That's my call. It's, at the moment, I'm, I'm looking shaky with my call. Well, no, 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 Max. I, I didn't say that they'll never do it, I, but it's illegal for them to do mo to conduct yeah, a program that's monetary. Yeah, but these guys don't obey any laws. They write the laws as they go along. What law? What rule of law do they obey? Does Jamie Dimon obey any law? Does Lloyd Blankfein obey any law? Does Mario Draghi obey any law? No. They can break the law on their way to the <clears> men's room. They can't take a <laughs> without breaking the law. They are law-breaking personified. <laughs> the problem is it's not going to work. It's different this time, but it's not different in the way that they think. They can purchase these bonds. All that it's going to do is it should encourage. I mean, in the UK, people can't even have a referendum. You know, people have wanted to have a referendum on an in-out EU membership for the past 10 or 12 years. All right, let's go back to Greece stuff for okay. a second. In other okay. words, you're saying that if Mario Draghi, in fact, box, he doesn't buy the toxic debt and the Ponzi scheme that's gone around the world for years and years, hits finally the immovable object called the ECB. Right. So we're talking about a revisitation of the 2008 crash scenario, but much worse, right? That's exactly right. Well, they're out of bullets. The gun is empty. His bazooka is empty. And there's not liquidity in any of these markets that was demonstrated last week. You, you see the bond prices, they gapped. 
which means that there's no, there are no buyers. The only buyer is the ECB. It's kind of like the Japanese bond market. There's nobody involved. There are no participants in the Japanese bond market anymore except the Bank of Japan. So all markets are broken. Every market that you look at is a massive asset bubble. So when people need liquidity, the only cash machine they can go to is the stock market, and they sell. We've got another chart. We can look at the DAX, as we were talking about. Yeah, we've got about 30 right? seconds. And then, can you stay oh. on for another segment? Oh, sure. Okay, we've got about 30 first. seconds to look at the DAX briefly. Okay, so the DAX chart shows a 15% decline, and my dog, Sammy, recognizes that the pop-up that we saw on Friday, Sammy's pretty smart. He said that that's a dead cat bounce. Woof, woof. So do I think that it's sustainable? Probably not. You know, I think we have more to come. All right, so we're going to carry this over to another segment on Sammy the dog, who reads charts, the DAX, okay. and uh, what it means to be Mario Draghi uh, and, and live as a transvestite under a bridge somewhere, fluffing guys for a nickel once this whole thing blows up. That's what we're going to be talking about. All right, don't go away. That's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Mitch Firestein of PlanetPonzi.com. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.